If you're having trouble with math at high school, college, or university level, you gotta try Galaxy Maths, an online tutoring service like no other. They offer top quality instructors to tutor you on whatever problems you're having. And get this, the more problems there are to solve in your order, the greater discount you'll get. Do not miss this opportunity. Galaxy Maths are always with you. Check out the link in the description. Now that the Clone Wars is over, the Star Wars Clone Wars TV show, I wanted to go back and revisit the prequel trilogy and kind of give my thoughts and analysis on rewatching episodes 1, 2, and 3 and seeing if what happens in Clone Wars affected my enjoyment of those movies and if it made those movies better and, you know, sort of how I feel about them. Not just with episode 3, because obviously the Clone Wars, epi- you know, season 7, uh, the last four episodes are part of episode 3 as far as timeline goes, but also with episode 1 because of Darth Maul and you know, there's a lot of things that Clone Wars did to sort of enhance the prequel story. Yes, the prequel trilogy has a lot of problems. You can't deny that. And I wanted to go back and see, okay, if we throw the Clone Wars TV show as a whole into this canon, into this continuity, which it is, you know... Does it make the prequel trilogy better? And I want to start off by talking about Phantom Menace. Now, last year in 2019, about a year ago actually, is when Phantom Menace had the uh, 20-year anniversary because it came out in 1999. And I saw Phantom Menace in theaters opening night. And I'll never forget that Star Wars Phantom Menace. Nothing was more hyped up than Phantom Menace. Even though Force Awakens was pretty close and even though Force Awakens did make a crap ton of money, Phantom Menace was the biggest thing, you know, the first Star Wars in 16 years, you know, the story of Anakin was going to get told, we were all kind of excited for it, and Phantom Menace was the first movie that I saw in theaters where you actually had security guards there, and I had been to a few opening nights before then, but that was, and I was a teenager, I was, I was a kid, and you have to remember, this is before the Aurora, Colorado theater shootings, and even before 9-11, so you wouldn't think that they would do something like this, the world was a lot more loose back then. But in this movie, for this movie, there was security there and a lot more ushers hired that night because it was a big film and they wanted to make sure nobody snuck in and things of that nature. You know, it was just kind of crazy. We had to wait in this line like for the uh, the movie theater. We had to wait in this line. Unfortunately, you know, I didn't get the best seats. I had to sat close to the front, but I didn't care because it was Star Wars. You know, it was something I grew up with since I was four years old. Finally, a new movie. You know, it's a big deal. And, uh, you know, that was my memories of my first viewing of The Phantom Menace, which I loved, by the way. It wouldn't be until a few years later that I would learn to not like this movie so much. And now, looking back on it, now that Phantom, no, I'm sorry, now that Clone Wars is over, have my thoughts change. And the one thing that really stuck out to me about Phantom Menace is that my thoughts on the movie from the time I had saw it before, which would have been around 2016. I know I rewatched the prequel trilogy before Rogue One, right? Was, uh, you know, the thing about Phantom Menace is my opinions have not changed that much, but they also are put more into perspective. Here's kind of what I think. The beginning of the movie, the very beginning of the film with the two Jedi Knights and, you know, Obi-Wan and Anakin... I'm sorry, Obi Wan and Qui Gon. Duh. Uh, when they first go to the, they first go to meet the Viceroy's, and then they get attacked or whatever the Trade Federation. Then they go to, you know, Naboo. They go to, they go underwater, meet the Gungans. All that stuff is good. Once they get to like the ship going through the middle of the Earth, the Earth, the planet core, is when it starts to kind of get long in the tooth. And you know, I was never a big Jar Jar hater. I really wasn't. I swear to you. I never really hated that character. I didn't think he was the sole reason for the movie being bad. There's actually a bigger problem. I think the issue with the film here is that, and with Jar Jar, is that he's on screen too much. I think if they would have toned him back a little bit, it wouldn't have been so bad. And George Lucas definitely misfired with Jar Jar, and we all kind of figured that out, and he even figured it out because Jar Jar is barely in the sequel, the the sequels to the to the first movie, you know, Episode two and three. He's not even in them, like one or two scenes. So even he knew that he would not be like Chewbacca, you know. Um, but the sort of stoic acting from Natalie Portman and Liam Neeson, I think, 
made sense because Liam Neeson as a character, Qui-Gon Jinn, as we found out through the Clone Wars and other media, is just a stoic guy. So I can't sit there and say that it's a boring, you know, oh, this was a boring performance. No, it fit the character. And I think Ewan McGregor was great. Um, Bray Park, obviously awesome as Darth Maul. One thing that has not changed is, um, actually, it has changed a little bit, is how much I appreciate the final fight. The, the duel of the fates between Qui-Gon, Obi-Wan, and Darth Maul still, to me, stands out as being absolutely fantastic. Um, it's amazing. And this time when I watched it, I appreciated things about it that I didn't appreciate before. First of all, the athleticism of Ray Park is second to none. I mean, he was perfect for that role. And his even his facial expressions I thought were great too. You know, this awesome Sith Lord that would end up getting chopped up by Obi-Wan and have it be his life's mission to get revenge on not just Obi-Wan, but also Palpatine for just leaving him and abandoning him and using him as a puppet. You know, Maul has become a very complex character thanks to the comic books, Clone Wars, and even Rebels. And seeing sort of this be the beginning of his story, as far as his hatred of Obi-Wan goes, did make him more interesting. And... You know, the, the the battle is great. John Williams' score is great. It was the most epic thing. It was the first time we had seen really fast lightsaber duels in the series. And I really enjoyed it, you know. And the sequel trilogy has, hasn't even come close to having a fight this good. I mean, it just hasn't. It was just fantastic. And that's never going to change. Now, everything around that, I did feel like the, 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 the raid on the castle was just a generic kind of shooting thing. It was, she was... Padme was pretty much Princess Leia before Princess Leia in the timeline, which is, it makes sense, that's her mother, but it didn't really capture my attention. Same thing with the battle um, in the field with the Naboo against the, uh, you know, the Gungans against the, the droids. Not that interesting. The space battle I thought was a little bit better than I remembered. Yes, I do think that Anakin, uh, Jake Lloyd as Anakin was quite annoying in this scene. Um, you know, what does this button do? Just... It didn't work for me, but really, the the problem with the film was not Jake Lloyd. That's another thing people always say is that, oh, Jake Lloyd was bad. Jake Lloyd was, was not the best actor in this film to play Anakin. He does have charisma, and there are some scenes that I think work, right? Especially, like, the scenes on Tatooine, you know, with his mother and all that. That's all good stuff. The scenes with him and Padme are a little bit weird. You know, are you an angel? A little bit weird, all right? But to me, that's really what hurt this movie was the middle part of the movie. I think the middle part of the movie really hurt this movie. I think that's what really made it not as enjoyable as it could have been. Now, looking back, the pod race, to me, was not that exciting. I know some folks love it. I know George Lucas loved it. I thought the pod race was... And I'm glad he tried something new. We hadn't really seen like a race before. You know, uh, I used to think the Kessel Run was a race You know, when I was younger. Uh, and I thought Solo executed that pretty well. But this right here... You know, this um, pod race, it just wasn't that interesting. It was cool to see some of the other creatures on Tatooine and things like that, but I kind of was hoping they would just move the plot along. And I know it's supposed to be an action set piece, but it just bored me. You know, a lot of that stuff in the middle really bored me. You know, them going to... that I remember when I was younger, the scene of, like, meeting Yoda and Mace Windu and, like, the Jedi Council was one of my favorites. It was the first time we had actually seen the Jedi Council, right? And that was a big deal as a kid. Like, wow, there's there's a lot of Jedi, you know. But now after seeing the Council all throughout Clone Wars, it doesn't really have the same impact as it did the first time I watched it. It's like, okay, well, we're at the Council. That's great. How feel you? You know, and that whole thing just kind of dragged on just a lot. You know, the, the movie has a really long second act that slows it down. One thing that Lucas has done effectively well in some of these movies is do a four-act structure. Like, for example... Attack of the Clones and Revenge of the Sith have four acts. And Revenge of the Sith does it way better. But um, I think Lucas is one of the few that could actually pull it off because of us. it's a Star Wars movie and a lot of stuff. There's a lot of content here. But with this movie, it just felt like it went on too long. Another problem I noticed with the movie watching it now was the idea that with episode one, and this is something that the prequels all kind of have an issue with. This is actually something that prequels in anything have an issue with. And that is the idea that if we're supposed to watch movies one, two, three, four, five, six in that order, 
it doesn't work. You, you can't watch it like that. You have to watch four, five, six, one, two, three. Or, you know, you could do Rogue One, four, five, six, one, two, three, but even that doesn't have the same impact. Episode 4, A New Hope, is the first story told chronologically, not chronologically, um, release order-wise, right? And that movie does an amazing job of introducing us to this universe. We find out who Obi-Wan is, we hear about the Clone Wars and, and him being a general, working you know, alongside ba- uh, Bail Organa. We hear about the Force. That movie explains the Force very well. If you watch it with Phantom Menace first, I feel like it's missing that. There's the explanation of the force in this movie is the midi chlorians, and it take and I've always felt like that takes away from the force, even though I know what Lucas is going for. I think it does kind of take away from the mysticism of it, and I feel like the way that Obi Wan explains things in Episode Four is much, 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 much better. And so when you're watching this movie in order, you have to kind of in your brain forget Episode Four and just watch it for what it is, and you're totally confused. Like, what are Jedi? What are Jedi Knights? What are they? You know, and you have Obi-Wan explaining it in episode four. They're keepers of the peace, you know, for over a thousand generations. All that good lore. But in this movie, they don't really explain that. Like, not, you know, we don't really know anything about how things work. The political system. They just kind of throw you into this world where Lucas, I guess, assumed that we're supposed to remember the previous three movies. Which we did because we saw those first. But I feel like for new fans, it's going to confuse them. And I haven't done this myself, but I have a friend of mine who has kids... And he told me that when he showed these movies to him, one, two, three, four, five, six, they had a ton of questions. And also, when Vader revealed himself to be Luke's father, they were like, oh, we knew that. That's not really a big deal. Luke didn't know? No, Luke didn't know. I thought Luke knew. It's like they didn't, they were a little kid, didn't understand that, you know, Luke did not know. And that's supposed to be the big impact now, but. The prequels do take away from that twist that people in the 80s got to experience, even though one could sit there and say, well, everybody knows this by now. It's part of pop culture. Yeah, but what about a little kid who's not really into pop culture? You know, a young kid, you know? So to me, the order has always been 4, 5, 6, 1, 2, 3. It's like you watch 4, 5, 6, then you say, okay, are you interested in watching more? Do you want to see the story of how Anakin became Darth Vader? And then you go to 1, 2, and 3. And really, when you think about it, and this is something nobody ever talks about, right? Here's a little breakdown for you. Nobody ever talks about this. Even though people think the prequels are made for kids more than the original trilogy, it's actually the reverse in that the prequel ta- the prequel trilogy, and this is a good thing, it tackles themes that kids aren't really going to gravitate to and that adults will. It tackles love. It tackles politics. It tackles... And, and by the way, the love is more so love and loss. Like... This idea that you can love somebody so much that you have dreams about them dying. Like, that's something that you don't really comprehend when it's, if it's just a Disney love story. We don't, we don't get that kind of stuff in these, like, kitty love story movies. We get that stuff in more adult, kind of grown up movies. And the choices that Anakin has to make, to me, are very, very grounded in reality, even though we, obviously it's way overhyped because it's the galaxy far, far away. But we've been in situations like this before where we have like our friends, a.k.a. the Jedi, putting us in weird, awkward positions. Of course, I'm talking about episode three now, not episode one, but I'm, using, I'm making a point here. Is that the prequels, I feel like, did capture things that, you know, were more powerful, that as adults we can relate with more. And so even though you have Jar Jar in, in Phantom Menace, and this is, you know, Phantom Menace is the most kidified movie of the entire saga, maybe, right? Because of Jar Jar, it's a kid's movie. That's what this, that's the most kid's movie, I would say. At the same time, like, it does tackle adult themes. But that being said, the way the Force is explained to me is actually more confusing for a your first-time viewer. So like I said, that middle part of the movie is just ass. Like, I wish they would have gone back and kind of fixed those problems. But the ending is is fantastic. I mean, Maul and just the story of what happens to him, you know, it all kind of starts here and it does... What Dave Filoni did with the Maul character to me is is great in that at first I was very against Darth Maul coming back when I first heard he was coming back in season five, I think it was. Uh, Four or five. It's been been a year. I think it was five. I didn't like that because I felt like Maul... You know, I was like thinking, okay, they're whipping out the gimmick table now. Okay, let's bring everybody back. Let's bring this person back, that person back. You know, it just it became like a sort of a cheap way to grab gravitate towards Maul's popularity. But what they did with the character, his internal struggle, his brother, the story about Palpatine, 
It all starts here in Phantom Menace. His feelings towards Palpatine, his feelings towards Anakin being the, the supposed chosen one that was actually being groomed to be evil. Like, all these different things, you know. All that stuff, I think, worked out. I think it really worked out. And it does enhance the Maul character. And I think it enhances the Obi-Wan character, too. And I think that Qui-Gon and the stuff he did as a ghost also helped out his character. So, the ending, I think, is better. Um, But the movie itself, to me, is not that great of a film. But one thing that did stick out to me is that it being shot on film was really, really good. I mean, for those who don't know or don't understand, Episodes 2 and 3 were shot on digital. Episode 1 was shot on film. And that's why Episode 1 looks more real. Episode 1 looks so much more realistic being shot on film, especially when you up-convert it to you know 1080p or 4K. It looks so much like, a, like they're in real environments, real sets, because they are. A lot of them are real sets and real environments. And I feel like Episodes 2 and 3 greatly suffered from this greatly and I wish there was a way to go back and reshoot all of this but it's pretty hard to do that because it was all done on blue screen and even though we have better tech now it, it, it would be a little bit better but it just not it's not going to feel as real so that's one thing about Phantom Menace that will always give it you know a thumbs up in the prequel playbook and that is that it's the only prequel shot on film and to me movies should always be shot on film I don't think there's any I'm sorry but I don't like digital we haven't gotten there to the point where digital movies can look that real and our eyes can tell what is real and what isn't. And watching these like extremely clean backgrounds in the episodes to it. Well, I'll get to that in those reviews when I get to them. Watching these super clean backgrounds just doesn't it doesn't look very real. And it, you know, this movie looks real. And that's one thing it has going for it. Every set looks like they're really there. Even when they're not. So Anyways, that's going to do it for my thoughts on Phantom Menace. <clears throat> Phantom Menace. Let me know what you think. Now, looking back, thank you for watching, and I'll talk to you soon.